internet land, if you're having difficulty with the slides, um, somebody unmute and uh, quickly tell me. Uh, does everybody see that this is a slide you've seen before illustrating the Coriolis force? Yep. Yes. Okay, great, great. All right, this is going better than it did uh, this morning. Okay, you've already seen this. Um, because the Earth is round and it's rotating, you, of course, don't feel the rotation because you're going around with it, right? If you think about it, you are currently traveling uh, east to west, uh, sorry, west to east, at a uh, speed of, at this latitude, probably something on the order of like 700 miles an hour or something like that. Uh, but, of course, everything that's around you uh, is going at that speed, too. Uh, so you don't notice it. You know, as long as the speed stays constant, you know, as long as the Earth doesn't suddenly stop, which it probably won't, uh, you don't notice it. Just like you can be in an airplane that is flying through the air 35,000 feet up at maybe 400 miles an hour and walk back and forth and do your thing just as you would uh, if you were still on the ground. Okay, right. The problem is that when, because different parts of the Earth are rotating at different speeds, if something moves, then the ground can move under it. So if you have a cannon at the equator, the cannon and the cannonball and the cannon cannoneers are moving at roughly a thousand miles an hour, but if you fire the cannonball north, the cannonball continues to move west to east at about a thousand miles an hour, but the land that it moves over is not moving that fast, and so the cannonball appears to veer to the east. The same logic works if you were to put the cannon at the North Pole and fire it towards the equator. Uh, let's say Santa Claus decided he was, I don't know, uh, Santa Claus decided he was really angry at um, Kenya and decided he wanted to take it out or something. Not that I know why Santa would do that. But if he were to fire a cannon from north to south, the same thing would happen. Uh, the uh, ball would veer. Uh, in fact, it would veer to its own right. And everything in the northern hemisphere tends to veer to its own right. And we mentioned last time that the effect is not that noticeable on a human spatial scale, but it started becoming a practical problem uh, once artillery guns got good enough that they could uh, fire at targets that the gunners couldn't see, uh, could fire at targets out of line of sight. It became necessary to start correcting um, your guns aiming for the Coriolis effect. This means that if you have an area of air where pressure is low, air will flow towards it. Right? And where you get low pressure is where air tends to be rising. So if air on the ground is starting to rise, you can't have a hole in the atmosphere, so air has to flow in from the sides towards the area where it's rising, right, to fill in the, the space. And so air flows towards a low pressure system, but the Coriolis effect deflects the air to the right, and it sets up a pattern of counterclockwise flow around the low. Uh, we call that cyclonic uh, flow. Uh, incidentally, for um, the same reason, air flows away from a high-pressure system, and the Coriolis effect causes it to flow clockwise around the high. Uh, we call that anticyclonic flow. 
And we're dealing with a sizable low pressure system in the Gulf of Mexico right now uh, that looks like it's going to do some serious damage to Lake Charles, Louisiana. Um, having lived there for a brief time, I have mixed feelings about this. But anyway, uh, if you look at a hurricane in the northern hemisphere, this was Irma from a few uh, years ago. Uh, you can see the directions of the spirals are counterclockwise because they're made by air flowing towards that low, right, right the eye of the hurricane, that's where the lowest air pressure is, and spiraling in towards it, uh, the air masses are bent uh, and veer uh, into a counterclockwise spiral, whereas in the southern hemisphere you get clockwise spirals around the low pressure system. Okay, this is review. You've seen these slides before. And if you look at it on an even larger scale than just one little hurricane, remember that we talked about how where the Earth is getting hit most directly with radiation from the sun, right? That solar radiation warms up the land and it warms up the sea. And warm land and sea causes the air to start rising. So we have this belt of rising air around the Earth's middle. It's at a bit of an angle to the equator because the Earth is tilted on its axis. But we have this band of rising air, and as air rises, it cools and drops its moisture. So we have a band of rain, and that's called the intertropical convergence zone. Uh, you remember that? Mm, okay, all right. Yeah, there's this band of rain and clouds that you can see in satellite pictures uh, running around the Earth's middle. And the air rises close to the equator and then comes back down at about 30 degrees north and south. And when it comes down, it warms up and it's dry because it's already dropped all of its moisture, which is why the Earth's deserts uh, tend to be centered on 30 north and 30 south, right? Yes. So we have this big convection pattern of air rising at the convergent zone and coming down at about 30 north and south um, and then just circling around and around. That's called a Hadley cell. And north of that, you've got a um, uh, another convection cell uh, moving in the opposite direction called the feral cell, and then north of that you've got polar cells. I'm not really going to worry much about those. But here's the point. Remember that wherever you have a zone of low pressure, you have air rising, and then surface air is pulled towards that low pressure zone to replace the air that's rising up, because you can't rip a hole in the atmosphere. Yes? So if it wasn't for the fact that the Earth is rotating, air would flow towards that intertropical convergent zone and it would just flow, you know, from the northern hemisphere it would flow south and the southern hemisphere it would flow north. Right? It would flow in both directions towards that convergent zone. But because of the Coriolis effect, Everything in the northern hemisphere veers towards its own right, and everything in the southern hemisphere veers towards its own left. And so you have a band of prevailing winds going from about 30 north, 30, 30 degrees north to the south and to the west. Those are called the northern trade winds. Hit the uh, lights, you might be able to see that a little bit better. And then in the southern hemisphere, you have a similar belt of surface winds that start at roughly 30 degrees south and blow to the northeast because everything in the southern hemisphere veers towards its left. And we call those the southeast trades. Okay, at 30 north and south, we've got this belt of permanent highs, and right there we actually don't have a great deal of wind at all. 
Uh, that was one of the reasons why all these voyages across the Atlantic or you know, around Africa or something like that uh, were dangerous uh, back in the days of sailing ships and exploration and you know, bold people setting out to find new lands and kill the natives and take their gold and claim it for Spain and all of that stuff. Uh, one thing that made those dangerous was that if you got stuck at about 30 north or 30 south, there might not be a great deal of wind at all. And in the days of sailing ships, that could mean you were going to be spending an awful lot of time there. And then the water would run out, and then the food would run out, and you'd have to start cannibalizing each other to survive. Right? Or possibly, you know, dying horribly from thirst. You know, running around with an albatross hanging around your neck and, uh, you know, all of that. North of that, though, you've got a belt of winds that's going in the northern hemisphere. It's going towards the northeast. Uh, that's called the prevailing westerlies. And you have another belt of westerlies in the temperate southern hemisphere. So the combination of convection combined with the Coriolis effect, sets up this global pattern of winds. As you might expect, this was very important in the days of sail. I've mentioned that crossing uh, 30 north and 30 south was potentially dangerous because you might not get any wind at all. Uh, they used to call those uh, the horse latitudes. Uh, because that was the point where the ship was stuck, they might have to throw their horses overboard so that there would be enough water for the crew. Uh, or possibly they might have to start eating their horses for uh, much the same reason. This was, this was the place that could get really dangerous. Um, towards the equator, the trade winds were used, you know, with you know, sailing ships going to you know, Southeast Asia or places like that, trading for spices and, and such, uh, they would make good use of the prevailing trades. So this actually sets up a lot of the, you know, the trade routes that were pioneered by the explorers back in the age of sail are constrained by the way the winds are blowing, right? Freddie Mercury would not have made a very good sailor uh, because any way the wind blows doesn't really matter to him, but it certainly had to matter to you if you were in charge of a ship. And the reason this matters for the oceans is that the prevailing direction of surface winds is what pushes around the water on the surface of the ocean and sets up the prevailing pattern of global currents. If we didn't have any continents, the ocean flow would be basically going in the same way. Uh, you have a belt of, in the northern hemisphere, you have currents that are going from northeast to southwest, and then north of that, you have a belt of currents that are going southwest to northeast. The problem is that the continents get in the way. Um, right? You can't have an ocean current uh, flowing across a continent because there's no water there. The ocean current has to get deflected. And because of these surface winds, uh, you set up these circular patterns that span entire oceans that are called gyres. There's a big gyre in the North Atlantic, for example. You'll see it in a minute, uh, where currents basically go around and around and around driven in a clockwise direction uh, by that pattern of surface winds. Uh, a portion of that gyre is called the Gulf Stream, and I'll talk about that in just a minute. Uh, there's another big gyre in the South Atlantic, and in the North Pacific, the South Pacific, and in the Indian Ocean. They all have these great big uh, gyre circulations that might take years to complete a uh, total, uh, a, a complete circuit. So prevailing winds push the ocean currents around and create these gyres. On top of that, you've got what we have already talked about, where very cold 
and saline water at the poles sinks downward and creates vertical circulation. Right? The surface winds drive water up at the surface of the ocean. The differences in solidity at the poles cause cold saline water to drop down, and it sets up this pattern called thermohaline circulation, which we have already spoken of. And the two of them work together. So there's that North Atlantic gyre I was talking about, uh, where basically the North Atlantic has this great flow of water. Uh, as the flow uh, cuts up along the uh, eastern coast of the United States and then bends around to cross the Atlantic, we refer to that as the Gulf Stream. Uh, the first person to map the Gulf Stream, by the way, uh, was a fellow by the name of Benjamin Franklin, uh, who you might have heard of. Uh, you might know him as the weirdo who flew a kite in a thunderstorm and almost got himself killed. Uh, but that was only a small part of what he did. He was one of the best scientists in the world at the time. And if you've ever used like a battery with a positive and a negative terminal, you're using Benjamin Franklin's uh, terms. He was, you know, one of the pioneering figures in understanding this thing called electricity. And yeah, the, the kite and the thunderstorm bit was only a small part of that. He also noticed that uh, sailing ships took less time to go from the United States to England than from England to the United States. And the reason was that those sailing ships could ride this natural current, the Gulf Stream, and get just a bit of a speed boost. Uh, they could shave a couple of days off the trip. Whereas ships coming from England, um, there's ways that you can sail without having to have the wind blowing right in that direction. You can angle the sail uh, to change your direction um, relative to the wind, but still, it was taking a couple of days longer to cross the North Atlantic from England to the uh, U.S. Well, it wasn't the U.S. From England to America, then from America to England. Because from America to England, you have the Gulf Stream pushing you along. And Franklin was the first to map this and make available this knowledge about how this was useful for trade and navigation. Okay, you with me there so far? Um, see, with my courses, you get um, two for the price of one. This is not only a science course. This is an American history course as well. And you might remember that um, trading patterns in colonial America and afterwards followed routes that are known as triangle trade. Anybody remember triangle trade? Uh, one example, uh, the, the other great musical about the American Revolution is called uh, 1776. And there's a song in there where, uh, I think it's the representative from Massachusetts is upset about slavery. And the representative from South Carolina gets up and say, don't be hypocrites, you benefit from it too. And he starts singing the song, molasses to rum to slaves. And what he's talking about is in the West Indies, down here in Cuba, Haiti, places like that, that's where the sugar plantations are. And so captains would buy um, sugar syrup, aka molasses, the raw syrup squeezed out of sugar cane. And then they would sail it uh, to either New England, places like Boston, or sometimes across to England, and have the molasses made into rum, now have it fermented and distilled, and then sail around the gyre again to the coast of Africa and trade the rum for slaves, and then sail across to the sugar plantations in the Caribbean and sell the slaves and buy more molasses, and so on. Uh, there were some other patterns than that, but what he's talking about is triangle trade, 
where you have three points where you can stop and trade your goods for something that will be in demand at the next stop. And what made the triangle trade able to run the way that it did was the North Atlantic giant. It was fairly easy to do because you could just follow the currents. There we go. There's your American history moment in the middle of the science course. I really ought to charge double. Okay, incidentally, in the center of that North Atlantic gyre, there's not much current motion at all. Uh, and this is another very dangerous place for you to get stuck if you are in a sailing ship without those currents to push you and without a huge amount of wind. You know, this is where you're going to end up, you know, bashing the captain over the head and eating his flesh or something fun like that. They used to just call it the custom of the sea was, uh, you know, killing your shipmates and eating them. And in the center of that gyre, without much current and without much wind, uh, the water is dominated by species of brown algae, brown seaweed, in the genus Sargassum. And Sargassum weed is specialized to float permanently. Uh, this is a seaweed uh, that actually generates these gas bladders on its blades. A uh, fair number of seaweeds not only create these leaf-like blades, but they can uh, they grow these gas bladders, um, and sargassum can float indefinitely. And so you have this buildup of sargassum weed in the middle of the gyre, a zone which is known as the Sargasso Sea. There are old legends to the fact that uh, yeah. Sail your ship into the Sargasso Sea. You'll never come out because the seaweed will wrap around you and drag you to Davy Jones and lock out. <laughs> um, the weed doesn't bother the sh doesn't bother ships, but this being a a area with very little wind, it still is a dangerous place. Even though the danger doesn't come from the seaweed. Right. Okay. Yeah, there, this is actually going to be featured in a new movie that's coming out about pirates. You heard about the new movie about pirates that's coming out? Oh, it's going to be rated R. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Now, the cool thing, we can briefly talk about actual biology instead of, um, you know, all of this geophysics stuff. Uh, sargassum weed. Here's some of it. You can see the leaf-like blades and some of the floats. And clumps of sargassum actually contain animal species that are specialized to live there and nowhere else. Uh, many of them beautifully camouflaged uh, to match the color and the texture of the sargassum weed. Uh, so uh, up here you've got a shrimp uh, clinging on to one of these blades. Uh, here's a beautifully camouflaged frogfish. Uh, you can see that its uh, fin spines, you know, even match the uh, little spines on the sargassum blades. And uh, you know, buried in a bunch of sargassum weed, this would be really hard to spot. And over on the left, you can see some more of those gas bladders uh, that the seaweed uses to float. So you've got this beautiful little ecosystem floating in the middle of the North Atlantic, uh, uniquely specialized for the conditions there, which I thought was cool. Right. Anyway, there are worse things than seaweed, by the way, that can build up inside the gyres. You might have heard about this thing called the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. That's basically a whole lot of floating plastic uh, that's built up in the middle of the North Pacific Gyre. Uh, plastic that's discarded from various places once it enters the middle of that great big swirl, uh, it's more or less stuck there. Now, this is a picture of a seabird uh, that died because its gut was crammed full of plastic waste. 
most of the plastic in the Great Pacific Garbage Patch is actually not that big. Uh, when you expose typical plastics uh, to very bright sunlight, and you know also you know the chemical effects of seawater, it tends to break down. So much of the plastic in the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, if you were sailing across it, you wouldn't see it because it's broken down into microscopic flecks. The problem is that there are lots of critters in the ocean that love eating microscopic flecks. Uh, filter feeders that would normally be feeding on, oh, you know, marine invertebrate eggs or larvae or single cell algae, uh, things like that. Instead of eating those, what they're eating is huge amounts of plastic. And this is potentially going to be really bad for the local uh, food web. You know, the base of the food web is replaced with plastic, which nobody can digest. Um, and yeah, it's a, when people talk about the garbage patch, they're often illustrated with big pictures of big identifiable pieces of plastic, like you know, plastic bags and uh, six pack rings and things like that. And that is a problem. But much of the plastic in the middle of the North Pacific gyre has been broken down into tiny translucent flakes. The problem is that tasty plankton often looks like tiny translucent flakes as well. So it is still a problem. It's not a problem you're going to be able to fix just by picking up big pieces of trash out of the ocean. Um, if we're going to clean it up, we're going to need some kind of filtering process that's going to be a lot more difficult. Probably be easiest not to put plastic in the ocean in the first place, but you know, what do I know? Right. So yeah, in that Great Pacific garbage patch, fragments of plastic outnumber the zooplankton by more than six to one. And again, if you took a boat through there, you might not notice anything particularly wrong. Okay. The Gulf Stream is just the western side of the gyre. Uh, this is a satellite image where they have sensed ocean temperature and color coded it. Uh, so you can see, you know, warm water is warmer colors, and then the blue and greens are cooler water. And right here, this almost black little band running up right along the coast of uh, Florida is the Gulf Stream. And Right about Cape Hatteras, North Carolina, right, that little sticky outfit right there is where the Gulf Stream breaks away from the Florida coast and starts moving across the Atlantic. And you can see, you know, the swirling uh, band of warm water uh, cutting across the North Atlantic there. That's the Gulf Stream right there, transporting warm water transporting heat from tropical latitudes northwards. And now you can see how, why we have these hooks right here. Uh, we talked earlier about, you can see this band close to the equator of very high rainfall, this little stripe of purple. Uh, right across the Earth's midsection, that's the intertropical convergence zone. That's that zone where it rains all the time. And 30 north and 30 south of that, you can see these yellow areas. Uh, that's the world's major deserts. Uh, the Atacama in Chile, uh, most of Australia, uh, the Mojave in North America, the Sahara in Africa, etc. But you might have noticed that there are some bands of rain that don't uh, correspond to the pattern. In particular, if you look at the North Atlantic off the coast of North America, you can see that band of uh, that band of blue. That results from warm water being carried northward by the Gulf Stream. As that water is carried northward, it warms the air. As the air warms up, it rises, and as it rises, it cools and drops its moisture. So 
So the Gulf Stream is not only bringing warm water northwards, it's warming the air and bringing rain, bringing moisture with it at the same time. Uh, you can really see it if you look at the North Pacific. You have this great, you know, the Pacific Equatorial Current uh, carrying warm water uh, all the way along the equator, and it too has to veer when it starts running into a continent. Uh, so you have this, you have the gyre in the North Pacific going in the same direction as the North Atlantic gyre. And as it breaks and flows northwards, it brings moist, warm air with it, and that in turn brings rain. So that's why you have that band of uh, rainy weather up here in the North Pacific. And you have a similar one here in the South Pacific, because the Pacific Gyre is doing this. And the South Pacific Gyre is doing that. Just as the North Atlantic Gyre is doing this, and the South Atlantic Gyre is doing <laughs> is doing that. It's all the fault of the Earth being round and rotating. Sorry, didn't mean to get political there, but you know, the Earth actually is round and it's turning. I don't care what they say on Facebook. Right. Then just another look at the Gulf Stream. Um, I don't remember who did this, but they dropped a whole bunch of buoys uh, that were um, fitted with uh, GPS uh, receivers and transmitters, uh, which means that every day they can get the location of every buoy. And you do this for several days and you can track, um, you know, how your buoy has been moving. And so each one of these squiggles is the track of a single buoy from day to day. And they color coded them so that buoys that are going north have tracks that are colored dark blue, and buoys going south have tracks that are color coded red, and buoys going west are color coded yellow, and buoys going east are color coded light blue. And you see this band of uh, light blue turning to dark blue right there. That's your Gulf Stream, right? That ribbon of blue right there is the Gulf Stream as seen from gathering data from a whole bunch of free-floating buoys with GPS fixes and satellite technology, which I happen to think is kind of cool. And you can see over here, right, this is where the Sargasso Sea would be, you know, on the right edge of this picture at about 30 north. And you see all of the colors there. Uh, that means the buoys aren't really going in any particular direction. They're going north, south, east, west, um, they're not going very fast, and they're not going in a very concerted, uh, concerted direction. They're just kind of bobbing, you know. Hey, whoa, man! Probably could have come up with a more technical way to put that, but you can see that. Yeah, just know that right here you don't have a preferred buoy direction, whereas you definitely can see it if you're looking at the. Uh, at the Gulf Stream itself. And yeah, Ben Franklin didn't discover the Gulf Stream, uh, but this is the map uh, that he came up with that he published. Uh, and he wrote, show pointing out that this would be useful to ships. And you can see his map right here is actually pretty darn close uh, to the actual course of it that we've mapped with you know, satellites and GPS buoys and things like that. Now, Franklin was a very smart dude. Okay. All right. The Gulf Stream, you're now looking at the North Atlantic. There's Greenland. Uh, the U.S. is pretty much off the map. This is Canada. Greenland, Iceland, Britain, Norway right here. The Gulf Stream cuts across the North Atlantic 
And once it breaks away, you have the North Atlantic Current. And the North Atlantic Current comes, you know, comes into contact right here with Ireland, uh, which is one reason why the climate in Western Ireland tends to be very cloudy and rainy, is that you've got warm water, you know, bringing moisture with it, uh, running into Ireland right there. And then a part of it actually keeps on going it's labeled the Norwegian Current. It's also called the North Atlantic Drift. And it comes up north of Scotland, right? And then comes up along the coast of Norway. The upshot of this is that the climate of Norway is a little bit warmer than it would be if it wasn't for the current. Um, I mean, it still can be pretty cold in the winter, but uh, the Vikings were able to settle back in the day uh, as far north as about here, up in a group of islands called the Lofoten Islands. And, I mean, it's still pretty rainy and it can be miserable, but it's a warmer climate than you would get over here in Greenland at the same latitude. And that's because that relatively warm North Atlantic drift uh, is literally transporting heat uh, from the tropics across the ocean, uh, making the current much more tolerable. Um, it's the same thing in northern Scotland, uh, all the way up here. It's, uh, yeah, it's, uh, okay, you can do agriculture farther north here than you could in a place like Greenland. Uh, because you've got these relatively warm temperatures up here. This is about as far north as the Vikings ever got. Uh, up here in, in the Lofotens, around the modern city of Tromsø. Okay, why does that matter? Well, what's driving the North Atlantic drift, by the way, is remember that we've got thermohaline circulation going on. Yes? As water freezes in the Atlantic, uh, in the Arctic, uh, the ice solidifies, and what's left behind is this cold and salty water that sinks down because it's dense. Yes? So it's the formation of sea ice in the polar regions that drives thermohaline circulation. Well, think about it. Remember, you can't rip a hole in the water if water is sinking somewhere. If you have water at the surface that's sinking down, then water has to be pulled in to replace it. Yes? Right? You can get in a bathtub and take your hand and try to push some water down, and you see that water would rush in from the sides uh, to fill the gap that you just made. Right? Yes? Well, Thermohaline circulation here is making water sink. So water has to be pulled in from the surroundings to replace the water that is sinking. And here's where that replacement of water is coming from. What is driving that Norwegian current is ultimately that thermohaline circulation. Warm water is being pulled in from the south to replace the cold water that's sinking. This is where not the only place, but one of the most important places where thermohaline circulation is connected with surface circulation uh, caused by the winds. Okay, you with me there? Remember we said that currents are very important to sailors. The fact that you've got warm water coming up here not only makes the climate a little bit milder, so it's a little bit more pleasant to be in Tromsø than it would be in the middle of the Greenland ice cap. It also means that ports up this way don't freeze over. And all the way to northern Russia, uh, that, uh, uh, that North Atlantic drift keeps the water from freezing, and it made it possible for uh, the U.S. and Britain in World War II to send huge amounts of supplies to the Soviet Union, who were our allies at the time because they were fighting the Nazis, 
uh, all the way around Scandinavia, all the way to the Russian port of Murmansk. Still dangerous as hell because German submarines were sinking every ship that they possibly could. Uh, but we still were able to supply the Soviets' war effort against the Nazis, taking advantage of that North Atlantic drift, uh, which meant that the Russian port of Murmansk, even though it's way the hell above the Arctic Circle, uh, never froze over. You could sail into it without needing icebreaker ships or something like that. So again, we'll go back to that map. Murmansk is actually off the map here, it's over here, all the way on the other side of uh, the northern cape of Norway right here. And it was riding that warm current that made it possible for us to get all of those supplies uh, across the North Atlantic if they didn't get sunk by German submarines um, and supply the Soviet war effort against the Nazis. Isn't that cool? All connected. History, science, you get both. I wish they paid me for both. Oops, I don't know what I just did. Okay, North Atlantic Drift. Uh, so yeah, there you've got a convoy of British ships escorted by Soviet fighters sailing into Murmansk with supplies for the Red Army. And it's been estimated that the amount of energy that's carried north of the tropics by the Gulf Stream and the North Atlantic Drift amounts to 10 to the 15 watts of power. Right? I know you have an estimate of you know the wattage of you know a typical light bulb uh, might be 60 watts or something like that, or at least for an incandescent it would be. Uh, you can do the math and get some idea of how much energy is getting transported from the tropics up to the Arctic by uh, the Gulf Stream and the North Atlantic Drift. Okay, cool, but should we care? Remember that what makes the North Atlantic Drift possible is that thermohaline circulation. You have to have water freezing and the leftovers sinking down to get thermohaline circulation going on. Well, one of the little problems that we have is that we're making less and less sea ice in the polar seas uh, because of this thing called global climate change. Sorry, folks, it's not actually a Chinese hoax. Um, it is, in fact, going on. Uh, we're seeing the retreat of continental ice sheets uh, in both the northern and the southern hemispheres. Canada just lost a very big ice shelf a couple of, maybe a week ago. Um, we're seeing loss of uh, ice sheets in Greenland uh, outweighing the formation of new ice that's been going on for some time. And one of the things that keeps planters up at night is that if we warm the earth enough that we no longer form these ice sheets, paradoxically, part of the world is going to get colder because without the formation of sea ice, we shut down thermohaline circulation. That's going to mean that large parts of the bottom of the ocean no longer have any input of oxygen, uh, which could re be really bad for certain deep sea fish that happen to be very delicious. You know, we could see a, a serious hit to fisheries if we can no longer fish for um, Chilean sea bass or orange ruffy or things like that. But it also means that without thermohaline circulation, there won't be anything to drag that North Atlantic drift northwards. You're still gonna get the gyre, it's still gonna go around but we're not going to have that branch of the gyre coming up north like this. And so the North Atlantic is actually going to get cold. Which means that it's going to be a lot less pleasant to live in Norway, in Scotland, in places like that. Uh, this is... Yeah, this is the uh, this is a prediction done 
as to what the world could look like in, I believe, 100 years, uh, put out by the uh, United Kingdom's uh, Meteorological Office, uh, the MET, as they call it. And much of the world could end up uh, rather a bit warmer, uh, but this particular part of the North Atlantic could end up colder if thermohaline circulation, uh, THC, uh, happens to collapse. So that's why I prefer the term, by the way, of global climate change to global warming. Global warming sounds like it's going to be a smooth process. Uh, global climate change captures a little bit more of the chaos that results when you mess with a very complex system. In fact, I've known people suggesting that what we ought to call what we're in for, not global warming, but global weirding. Because the Earth's climate is likely to get, on average, warmer, locally considerably more weird. So if you release large amounts of fresh water into the North Atlantic, um, these are projections for what could happen to the Greenland ice sheet. Uh, it currently is, in fact, starting to melt. Uh, we're seeing less ice laid down and more of it disappearing every year. And if the ice sheet on Greenland melts, what's going to happen is we release lots of fresh water into the North Atlantic. That would shut down thermohaline circulation and paradoxically make that part of the world less warm. Which is weird, but there you have it. That's global weirding for you. <laughs> okay, great. I'm not sure how much time I have, but I'm going to go ahead and stop there. And has anybody got questions? Okay. Uh, I'm not hearing any questions from the people that are in the room. I'm not seeing anything on the chat. So I'm going to go ahead and stop recording.